Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about ARIMA-like models, starting with the humble random walk. So let me summarize what we have covered so far. So we started with super simple methods, and the idea was trying to predict the future using very simple ideas. For instance, the, the random walk idea was predicting the future as the last point. This seems very hard, but, but in the end, in the stock market case, we saw that this was really accurate. We also cover the random walk with the drift, which actually was a kind of a linear regression in which the future is trying to capture the inner set, which is the last value, plus some overall trend. And we cover also the average value, in which we take the average of the whole series, or a window of, let's say, 90 days, and we were trying to say that the future is going to be, on average, uh, the same as before. Next, we cover decomposition, and the idea was really simple. So we were trying to use different types of averaging, in order to capture the trend and seasonality. So we have a signal, and then we take a moving average of this. We, we, ha we saw more sophisticated ideas, but, but, but the idea in the end was something like that. And now that we have the trend, we can subtract, and, and we have the detrended series. And then again, we do a sort of moving average, but instead of using the neighborhood of the points, we were using the period of the series. So if this series is repeated by week, then we were subtracting every week. And then we have the seasonal part. And then the reminders should be noise, and we have some criterion to decide if this was pure noise or not. So in the end, the future was something like a kind of trend that we were trying to predict. Then the trend is seasonality, which is something that repeats over and over again in the future. And then the reminder, which is pure noise, that we can add to add some flavor to our predictions. And finally, we cover exponential smoothing. For instance, here you have a summary of whole winter's exponential smoothing with seasonality. And the idea is the following. Trying to predict the level of the last point, doing a uh, weighted average of the last observation with, with weight alpha plus 1 minus alpha something. And this something is the trend, which is the slope, the seasonality, and our future is going to be something like the smoothest last observation, the smoothest trend, and the smoothest seasonality. Philosophically, this means that we look at how the curve looks like, not at why it behaves like that. And traditional models are trying to describe the trend and seasonality of the data. ARIMA-like models, on the other hand, are trying to predict why, and why is that, it's describing this in terms of our correlation. So with our correlations, when we talk about regression, so let me talk about our correlations in time series. So imagine that we have this time series, and this is the our correlation function. What's the idea of this? The idea is changing the lag, so looking at, looking at the past, for instance, lag equals 1, means that we are looking at, at every point and comparing that point with the past, and then lag equals 2, and so on and so forth. So there is a pattern in this example, so here you see that this bar is negative and actually large in absolute value, this green bar is positive, and all the rest of the bars are behind this blue dashed line. So let me explain this a little bit. So imagine that we create some new data, so this is our original, original data series, and we are querying uh, y t minus 1, t minus 2, and so on and so forth. This is minus 3. So imagine that we don't know about this, and we imagine that y is the output and y t minus 1 is the predictor, and we perform a linear regression. Then r squared is going to be the correlation, or r, actually r is going to be the correlation between these two series. So what's the meaning of this minus 0.6? This means that there is a negative correlation, and this is really significant. So you can see that we can predict the future using the past. And what's the meaning of the negative value? This means that for larger values at t minus 1, I'm, I'm going to have lower values of t, yt and the other way around. So for negative values in t minus 1, I'm going to have positive values in t. Next one, what's the meaning of this green bar? Again, if we plot yt versus yt minus 2, then we see a positive correlation. This slope is going to be lower. Uh, you, you can see that here this is more, uh, more large in absolute value, and this is related to the relative uh, scales of these two bars. But again, uh, we, we see that uh, positive large values of y, yt minus 2 are correlated with positive large values of yt and, and so on and so forth. So this is why this is positive. And what's the meaning of the blue lines? Okay, this is a slight correlation, but this is not very large. So actually, you can see this is positive again, but this is a small. Okay, next question. So which one of these pictures does not change in time? So forget about fluctuations. Um, and in, in the meaning of the question is, in which of these cases we can say that the series is the same all the time? And I'm not including seasonality. For, for instance, all these curves are seasonal. So these are not steady in time, so they are changing. Actually, a Monday and a Tuesday are going to be different. Also, these curves have trend. You can see that this is a growing trend. This is something like a largely fluctuating trend, and actually this is a kind of sign with some noise. Here again, you have the trend. 
again here you could say that you have a growing trend and a decreasing and a growing trend again so if you have to choose i would say that probably this is noise despite of this fluctuation and this looks like seasonal but if you take a look the distance between the peaks is not periodic you could say that these two are basically the same in the future in the past so are the winners of this contest this concept of being statistically equal in the future and in the past is called stationarity. Sometimes stationarity is not evident from the data and you have to do some manipulation of the data. So for instance, you can obtain a stationarity by differencing. So if you take a look at the Google 200 days stock market data set that we have discussed in the past. Actually, you can see that you have a growing trend, but if you take the, the derivative, the difference of the value, each value with the previous one, then you can see that you have this stationary series. Okay, so what? If you take a look at the or correlation function, then you can see something which is artificial. So this is smooth decay is related to the fact that we have a trend. So this is not significant. This, is, this does not mean that you can predict the future and this is completely correlated. Basically, this is saying that overall the curve is growing. Actually, if you take a look at the difference, you can see that you, that you don't have significant correlations there. So basically, the future is uncorrelated with the past. I will explain these dashed blue lines in another video, but basically anything that is between these blue lines can be considered as pure noise. So here this means that the stock market is pure noise. Actually, that is more complicated than that because sometimes we have these jumps in the data. But overall, the data is completely uncorrelated. So this example is called random walk model and, and let me show you what this means. So random model is a simple model in which the future is going to be exactly the last value plus some Gaussian noise. So let me generate some random walks. So you, there are some functions to do this, but this is a very poor man's way to generate those. So I'm generating a thousand random numbers, uh, Gaussian random numbers. Okay, norm comes from the normal distribution. And then I'm taking the sum. And this is uh, how it looks like. It looks like the stock market. So you have these jumps and these fluctuations. And let me explain why I'm using this sum. So if you take the original formula and then you replace yt minus 1 by, by, the, by the same formula, you have something like yt minus 2 plus the noise at that step. And then the, the former noise that we have here. And then again, you can replace yt minus 2 by yt minus 3 plus blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you have the first value plus all the noises that you have in the past. And this is why this is called a random walk. It's a walk because you're taking one step at a time and it's random because in the end, the last value is going to be the sum of completely uncorrelated Gaussian numbers. So remember this idea that the future is going to be a random original number plus a lot of noises added together. And this is kind of depressing. So if you compare, if you compare the, for instance, the Google stock market with this random noise, you can see that besides this jump that we cannot explain here and it's related to the forces of the market, basically the shape of the curve is more or less the same. Sometimes, as I was saying before, you, you can take a stationarity by differencing. So sometimes you have to define the derivative one step at a time. Remember that we are taking discrete data and this is the derivative. So the idea is that you take something like this, which you have a trend, it's a random walk, and you end up with pure noise. Okay? And the idea of using this is that you can remove this smooth trend and have something which is completely uncorrelated. Again, if you take the stock market and then you classify all these points, you can see that the observation 165 is the one with the noise. So if you remove and you take the standard deviation of all the series with, without this one, you can see that this jump is a 14 sigma event. This means that the stock market is actually not a random walk because from time to time you have something that you can't explain with a normal distribution. So the probability of having a 14 sigma event is something like one in I think 13 trillions or something like that. So it's completely impossible to explain that. Okay, so let's finish this video with some useful definitions that we are going to cover in the future. So let's start with the mean, the variance and the covariance. Probably you've seen this in, in basic statistical courses, but the idea is really simple. For a stochastic process, for a time series in which we have discrete times, zero, plus, minus one, whatever, the mean is simply the, the expected value of the series. So you can calculate this using the sample mean, which is adding all the values together and divided by the number of observations. So for instance, if you're looking at a series of different realizations of the series, you can imagine in your, in your brain something like this. So these are the variance at some time, so the fluctuations at some time. These are the fluctuations at a later time, and so on and so forth. So the mean is something like the average of these fluctuations from time to time. The or co or covariance function is something like 
compare different values at different times. So it, this is the expected value of correcting this value with the mean and this value with this proper mean. So actually we're, we're somehow taking an idea of how the differences between these variances are in time. And the error correlation function that we have covered in this ACF plot is basically doing that at uh, normalizing by the variance at each point. So instead of taking the absolute value of that, we're taking the relative variance of this, of this time. This function is really useful. It has some interesting properties. So if you use the same time, this is the classical variance that you have covered in the statistics. You have another properties like, for instance, rho is normalized. So rho tt is one because basically you're doing a linear regression of a series with itself. This is reversible because the linear regression of a x versus y is the same as y versus x. And this is lower than one because remember that r squared is always lower than one. And remember the interpretation that we did. So we can keep this interpretation for the or correlation function. Okay, so for instance, uh, uncorrelated means that the future is going to be like a, a scattered cloud of points if you plot that versus the past. We so obsessed with correlations because, for instance, imagine that beyond s equals 3 or t minus 3, this is uncorrelated. That means that the future can be explained or can be described using just a, a, a few bunch of lags. So what? Well, the idea of using stationary processes is that the sample moments are the best estimators of ensemble moments. So you can plug this into R or, or even a calculator and you have the best description that you can have of the data. So now what? So we have started with this very simple random walk model and there are a couple of ways or a few ways in which we, we can generalize this. For instance, we can include the derivatives. So instead of saying that this is my series, my series is going to be the difference between the, the original series. We can also include different weights. So instead of having a one here, we can have 0.8 and 0.8 means that the future is going to be almost like the past, but not completely equal. And we can have a, a myriad of different combinations of lags. So we can say that the future is going to be an average weight of, for instance, two lags in the past of Y, but also it's correlated with different values of the noise. So th this, uh, these random numbers sometimes in the stock market lingo, they are called jumps or impulses. So basically I'm saying that the future is going to also depending on the last impulses in the data. And this uh, overall is going to fall into a very broad field called ARIMA-like model that we are going to cover in the following videos.